Hello and welcome to another Spruce and Bruise unboxing. Today we've got a really exciting one because we have got the brand new Warhammer Age of Sigmar Dominion launch box. So it's been six years since Age of Sigmar came out and a lot has changed in that time from a fairly rudimentary rule set with just a couple of pages uh, through to the General's Handbook, the amazing Soul Wars box and now onto Dominion. I think it's a really exciting time to get into the game. Uh, massive thanks to Games Workshop for sending us a free copy of Dominion a little bit early for us to have a look at and unbox with you guys. We are going to be having a look at all the miniatures, having a look at what you get in the launch box and having a full look through the rule book as well and seeing what uh, what changes there are, what's mixed up the game a little bit. New edition of the game is always a really exciting time to uh, reset the meta and maybe iron out a few kinks out in a previous edition. So really looking forward to seeing what is in that. This box is up for pre-order on Saturday. So yeah, if you want your own Dominion box, I would get in there quickly because I imagine this is gonna fly off the shelves. So before we crack it open, let's have a quick look at the back of it and see what we get in here. So yeah, as you can see, absolutely chocker full of models. We've got the Stormcast Eternals in here and a new faction, the Cruel Boys, who are a, uh, a new tribe of Uruks that have been uh, introduced to the game, along with a full hardback rule book. We've got some War Scroll cards. There's some Allegiance Abilities cards, which are nice. I, I hope we see that kind of thing for other factions in future. And we kind of get a quick start guide as well. So not dived into this yet myself, because I wanted to do it live with you guys. So let's open it up and see what we get within this big chunky box. Uh, it's a similar size box to Indomitus. So big old heavy set here. So first of all, we get some really nice artwork. They've been doing this on a few sets uh, over the last couple of years, having the full kind of artwork from the book. It's just a divider to protect all the plastic frames, but they're really nice. I uh, quite fancy framing this, because it looks cool. So move that to one side, and we get a big old box full of sprues. So what I'll do, move this to one side, and we'll have a look through these one by one and see what we get. So first of all, we get a pair of frames for the Hobgrots. So these are the new, essentially, Hobgoblins. And uh, yeah, fans of uh, the world that was, Warhammer Fantasy, will recognise these guys, or at least their influencers, from the Chaos Dwarves who had um, Hobgoblins working for them. And yeah, this seems to be a theme that they've got in here now. I, at the time of filming this part, I haven't read through any of the lore of these yet. Later on in the video, I'll have maybe checked out some of the lore, so I'll uh, put in my thoughts on the faction as a whole in there. But these are really, really nice models. Now you get two of these frames. I imagine in a similar way to the Necron Warriors, I can see this being a, a, a box you can buy. Um, if you remember from Indomitus, the stuff individually uh, would cost a lot more than the, the value of the box if you bought it all separately. So yeah. If you are starting either of these armies, it's probably a good shout to uh, to pick up this box. That's the Hobgrots. Next, we have the new Stormcast. Again, we get two frames of these as well. And again, wouldn't surprise me if they're sold in boxes like this. Now, the Vindictors, I believe these are called. These are really, really nice Stormcast. They've come on a long way from the uh, the original ones that we got way back in the very first Age of Sigmar uh, starter box. And obviously we've got some revisions to them over the years, such as the, uh, the kind of uh, cloth areas on the Sacrosanct Chamber. These take it in a more, I guess, Greek slash Roman direction, with the kind of shield and spear motif. You've got a really nice sculpted banner on there as well. And again, you get two sets of these. So I think you get five on each. I can't see myself from a kind of aesthetics point of view ever using any of those old Stormcast again. I, I I just love the look of these guys. Don't know if they'll get a full kit or whether it'll be a deal like with Necron Warriors. It's just this kit that's available. I'd like to see a, a separate kit come out with some different weapon options, but uh, yeah, they're certainly nice looking models. Next, we get the frame of the uh, the new Elite Stormcast guys. Again, really, really nice sculpts. Really, really nice weapons on them. Interestingly, again, these are a single frame. So in Indomitus, one of the things that we saw was the stuff that was on its own frame 
got released as its own box so the um the, the destroyers and the outriders so again it wouldn't surprise me if this is the set available for these guys uh but they look really good praetors i think they're called yeah these are really really cool some really nice details on these Next we are framed with a couple of the characters, one for the Cruel Boys and one for the Stormcast. Again, this is similar to the way we saw uh, Indomitus packaged. So after Indomitus we got the three different size starter boxes. And it wouldn't surprise me if some of these heroes are split over those different boxes separately. But yeah, they are, they are really nice models. I'm probably going to be working on the Stormcast myself from this box. Uh, by the time this video goes out, hopefully I've got some paint on some of these as well. So at the end of the video, we'll have a bit of a, a miniature showcase um, to show off the, the built models. And if we've got them painted, I'll probably do a separate video with all the uh, the painted miniatures in. But yeah, these are really ace. I'm looking forward to getting some paint on them. Next up, we've got another character sprue, essentially. So this is one of the other bosses with his little uh, grot sidekick. Again, really, really nice uh, sculpts on here. They look really vicious, the Cruel Boys, and I quite like that. And then we've got the Stormcast uh, Caster on here as well. And she looks really cool. She's got a couple of uh, head options. If we have a look there, you can either have her with a bare head or with a kind of mask, which is really nice, and some cool sculpted bases included on the frame as well. So yeah, really good. Again, I can see one of each of these sprues being in the different levels of starter box when they eventually come out. And this is just a guess, we don't know anything sure for that, but it, the number of sprues and the kind of uh, bits that we get in there does tend to match what we got for the, um, for the Indomitus box. So we have a big Cruel Boys frame here. This has got the, the big character on the box with his big kind of uh, monstrous beast thing. Looks really, really nice. Really weird looking creature, that. And then we've got some of the other uh, Cruel Boys on here. So the, the crossbow guys. And they look really, really nice. Really love the style of these Cruel Boys. Uh, I mean, when this... Obviously, this box will be uh, painting rapidly by the Sprues and Brews team to get some battle reports up, but I'm absolutely going to be ordering one of these boxes as soon as I can. To, uh, to paint up my own destruction force because I really like them, they look really good. Next in the box is the sprue of Cool Boys themselves and again these are very very nice. They've got some nods to some old um, Warhammer Fantasy stuff. So you've got the various glyphs on the shields with the, with the faces. Very uh, reminiscent of some of the old John Blanche stuff. And kind of a lankier, crueler looking orc which is uh, fitting for the name. Again, these guys look so good. Like I say, if you hang around for the end of the video, I will have a, a bit of a uh, showcase where I'll show off the built miniatures and, and how they stack up next to each other. But yeah, they look very, very nice. And then finally, we get the unique Stormcast sprue. So again, just like with Indomitus, there's a, a kind of a mixed sprue for the Stormcast and a mixed sprue for the Crawl Boys, as well as those separate individual sprues. Which makes me think this will probably be exclusive to this Dominion box for the time being, alongside the, the other sprue with the, the monstrous mount on. So yeah, on here we've got the new, I guess, Terminator equivalent, Stormcast with a big shield and the 2 plus save. We've got that really nice banner bearer with the sculpted banner, which just looks incredible. Really looking forward to painting that. And then we've got the character as well. Indrasta, the uh, Celestial Spear. I can't believe this is a push fit model out of a starter box, launch box, sorry. Um, looks so, so good. They've, they've certainly come a long way with the, uh, the casting and the moulds for plastic models. You know, you could argue that some of the recent plastic releases are, you know, as good as some of the stuff Forge World used to put out. But yeah, really like these. So yeah, that is all the models, but that is not everything that we've got in the box. So we get another divider protecting the kind of paper parts from the plastic frames above. So we'll take that out. 
and we'll see what is in here. So we get a little package here with some goodies in. Let's open that up and see what is in here. So here's the majority of the paper stuff. We've got the full instructions for building all the models. As we've seen again with some of the recent sets, they've got a nice little guide here to show you what size bases to use, which is really cool. And then again, we've got the full construction manual for all the miniatures in the box. Again, being push fit, these probably aren't going to be too hard to put together, and a lot of them are in very few parts, considering how elaborate the models are. So yeah, really, really nice stuff. I am very much looking forward to building these guys. Um, what we see on these as well is that most of these have got multiple head options as well. So obviously the Stormcast tool come on two sprues of five. It means that you're going to have different heads in all of them, which looks cool. Yeah, very, very nice, the Stormcast in here. I think I'm going to go for the the classic gold and blue colour scheme when I'm painting mine. And onto the Cruel Boys, obviously the big carriage has got quite a few parts, but the rest of them are probably only going to be a couple of parts each. And they look so nice. Yeah, I really, really like them. And the Hobgrots. So yeah, really cool. I, uh, I like they've got two different varied factions in the box. We also get a War at Amberstone watch uh, kind of start guide which will give us a bit of information about the setting, the uh, the conflict in the box. This is very much your kind of like introductionary uh, kind of leaflet to go through into the who the factions are, who the characters are, a bit of lore about them. So really nice, like a mini codex really, mini battle tome detailing all the factions, Praetors, those guys are called, yeah. Really, really nice. Gives you a bit of flavour about who they are. Obviously the Cruel Boys are an entirely new faction as well, so we get some information on those. Uh, I'm interested to see if the Chaos Dwarfs get a get a name check. Yeah, it does, yeah, it mentions the Chaos Dwarfs, so hopefully that's a hint that, um, you know, maybe we'll see Chaos Dwarfs in at some point in the future. That'd be really fun. So yeah, really nice introductionary book there. We also get War Scrolls for all of these as well, so I've not actually seen all these yet, so let's take a look at what the profiles look like. So in the box we get two sets of War Scroll cards with all the stats and points and allegiance abilities for the uh, the armies in the box. So first of all we've the Killer Boss, let's have a look at him. So what have we got here? He's got a 5 inch move, 6 moves, Bravery 7, 4 plus save, accompanied by a Stab Grot. Uh, cool. So, got an ability for friendly crawl boys unit fails a battle shock test within three inches of any friendly unit with this ability. Only one model will flee. That's pretty handy. So you can limit yourself against big battle shock there. Uh, you hold them off each time a wound or mortal wound is allocated to the unit, and not negated. You can choose to risk the unit stab grot. If you do, you must roll a dice on a one to five. The stab grot is killed. And the wound negated. On a six, the stab grot is not killed, and the wound is negated. That's pretty cool. So you've kind of got a, uh, a wound shrug that may or may not stick around, depending on if you get lucky. If you keep rolling sixes, then yeah, the stab got lives. But I guess you're gonna negate the first wound that he takes in the game, which is pretty fun. Pretty good profile as well, four attacks, hitting on threes, wound on threes, minus one rend and a flat two damage, uh, along with the flail with a couple of attacks as well. Yeah, he looks pretty cool, quite like him. And uh, notice that the keywords, he's got the Uruk War Clans keyword as well. So obviously we might see more when we're digging through the book in a little while, but um, yeah, it, I, I've got a feeling that rather than a Cruel Boys battle tome out, I think we might see a new War Clans one that includes these and Kragnos and all that cool stuff. So yeah, he's pretty nice. Next we've got the Swamp Caller Shaman and Pot Grot. So what have we got here? Again, he's got a Pot Grot that counted as a single model. Uh, it looks like he can give a friendly unit within three inches uh, ele elixirs or poisons. That's pretty cool. Basically allowing you to uh, add one to saves or make your poison allegiance ability tick off on a five rather than a six. That's pretty cool. And then the pot grot, uh, what does the pot grot actually do? Is he got any rules there? I don't think he does. So he's got a spell as well, Summon Bogey Mist, casts on a 7, and if it goes off you add 1 to charge rolls for friendly cruel boys, and subtract 1 from charge rolls for other units on the battlefield, that's pretty cool, I like that, that's pretty nice. 
Next we've got the Killer Boss on Great Nash Tooth. This is the big beastie in the box, the kind of like general of the force. He is pretty cool. 10 inch move, 10 wounds, big chunky guy, a lot of attacks, flat two damage as well. Not massive Ren, but you know, minus one Ren, minus two Ren's pretty good. Uh, all part of the plan. He's got the same ability as the other one, so if there's Battle Shock within three inches, they only lose one model. And Savage Hound, add one to hit rolls when he makes a charge. Yeah, he's pretty cool. I like him. Next up, we've got the Merc Knob. So the Merc Knob is the kind of banner bearer character in the box. When a friendly Cruel Boys unit within 12 inches is affected by a spell, on a 5+, plus, ignore the effect of the spell. That's really good. Yeah, that's very, very good. Um, I mean, Kragnos has got a lot of built-in magic defence. Potentially, this army could be really good at ignoring the effects of spells. Yeah, I quite like that. Uh, and then, Birth of the Maya Drakes. The start of the combat phase while the dice for each enemy unit within three inches. On a one, nothing happens. On a two to five, they suffer a mortal wound. On a six, they suffer D3 mortal wounds. So again, yeah, pretty cool. I mean, for his spell shutting down aura, he's worth taking. Yeah, he's cool. We've got the Gut Rippers, so these are the kind of the, the new uh, infantry unit. Let's see how these stack up. They've got two wounds apiece and a five plus save. Two attacks each. Um, the, the boss has an extra attack. The start of the charge phase, if the unit is more than three inches away from all enemy units, pick an enemy unit within 12 inches that is not a hero or monster and roll 2d6. Add one to the roll for every five models in the unit. If the roll is equal or greater than the bravery of that unit, subtract one from hit rolls. That's pretty cool. So they kind of psych out enemy units and uh, make it harder for them to hit. Yeah, that's pretty fun. They're, they've got not much in the way of rend, but two attacks each. Yeah, they're pretty cool. We've then got the Hob Grot Slitters. So yeah, I'm interested to see what these guys do. Only one wound each, as you'd imagine. They're only grots. Uh, they have got grenades, so an eight inch ranged attack, which wounds on threes minus one rend is pretty good. Uh, they've got a standard bear which lets you reroll battle shock tests. Uh, the musician can let you run and shoot. That's pretty handy. Um, and then stab them good if the unmodified hit for an attack with the slitter knives is a six. It scores two hits on the target. Bear in mind they get two attacks each with them. They only wound on five, so they're not the most uh, offensive unit in the world. But those grenades are pretty nice with a minus one rend and being able to run and uh, lob them. I think they could be pretty good. Uh, but the man at Skewer Bolt Boy, so these are the crossbow fellas. Uh, it looks like you can have two different shots with it a hasty shot or an aimed shot. The aimed shot only gets one shot, but hits on a two wounds on a three, minus one rend and two damage. Or if you're feeling particularly lucky, you can double the shots at a shorter range. It's only hitting on fours, uh, but it's the same rend and damage. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think I'd probably go for the aimed shot, you've got more range and you're more likely to get them through, but two attacks each, if you're feeling particularly lucky, you might be alright there. Um, what else do we do here? When a unit attacks with a man skewer crossbow, use the aim shot if it did not make a normal move. Otherwise, use the uh, the hasty shot. So basically, if it stays still, it's away from enemy models that can use that, um, that, that longer range, easier to hit profile. If it moved, however, it uses the hasty one. Yeah, I quite like that. They're, they're pretty fun. And then finally we get the Cruel Boys Allegiance Abilities, uh, with all the points on there as well. So the Gut Rippers are 180 points for 10 and our battle line, uh, with all the various characters there. Uh, Hobgrot Slit is a 95 points for 10, which is pretty cheap. Uh, and the Allegiance Ability, if the unmodified hit roll for an attack made by a Cruel Boys Uruk is a 6, the attack does a number of mortal wounds uh, to the target equal to the weapon's damage, and the sequence ends. That's really good considering we have got a lot of damage to abilities that are ranged. So those uh, bolt boys could be doing mortal wounds. I mean the grenades, are they? So how is it for a cru cruel boys uruk? So I don't think that the hobgrots will get that because technically they're not uruks. But everything else, yeah. Any unmodified hit of a 6 does mortal wounds, and obviously we've seen that there's a way to get that up to 5 plus with the Shaman as well. Yeah, they look pretty cool. So let's do a quick tally to see how many points we actually get in the box for these. 
So all in all, you get 10,070 points of Cruel Boys in the box, which is great. That's an amazing start for an army. Interestingly, you only get one battle line uh, unit, though, uh, obviously, there may be changes to the way armies are built, so we'll look at that in the uh, in the look at the rule book later on. But yeah, next, let's have a look at the Stormcast Eternals. So next we've got the Stormcast Eternals, and again we've got War Scroll cards and an Allegiance card for each of these. First of all we've got Indrasta, the Celestial Spear. Really looking forward to seeing what she looks like. So 8 wounds, 12 inch move, 3 plus save, 10 bravery. Uh, with an 18 inch range, 1 shot missile weapon, hits on 2s, wounds on 2s. Minus 2 rend and d6 damage is pretty tasty. And then the Blade of the High Heavens, 4 attacks, hitting on 3s, wounding on 2s. Minus two rend and flat three damage. She is crazy good. Uh, Prime Huntress. If any enemy monsters are within three inches, add ten to the number of wounds suffered when determining the row on the damage table. That's really cool. So basically, you can, I don't know, get them down to halfway on the profile, have her nearby, and they count as being on the bottom tier of the profile. That's really cool. Uh, Champion of Sigma has a 4 plus ward, so that is something new that we'll probably see in a little bit when we look at the main rule book. I do wonder if that's like an invulnerable save or some kind of mortal wound save. We'll, uh, we'll clarify that when we go through the main look of the rule book. Uh, Dazzling Brilliance, once per turn in your hero phase. If the unit's on the battlefield, you can return one slain model to each friendly Stormcast Eternals unit with a wounds characteristic of 3 or less that is wholly within 12 inches of the unit. That's amazing too, so she can bring back models to friendly units. Really excited about this person already. Uh, and then the Hawk of the Celestial Skies. Do not take Battleshock for friendly Stormcast and Cities of Sigma within 12 inches. That is really cool. And there's no like keyword shenanigans there. She, um, yeah, just all Stormcast and Cities of Sigma, so that's really cool. Uh, next we've got the Lord Imperitant. So he's the new guy out of the animated trailer. He has got a 18 inch range uh, baton, d6 attacks, 3 plus to hit, 3 plus to wound, minus 1 rend, 1 damage. Again, some pretty good range attacks on these guys. Uh, his Warhammer does 4 attacks, 3s, threes, 3s, threes, minus 1 rend, 2 damage. And then he's got his Griff Hound as well fighting alongside him. Uh, they are treated as a single model, so you can't like take out the Griff Hound. Uh, once per turn, he can issue a command without a command point being spent, which is pretty cool. And then once per turn at the end of your movement phase, if any friendly units with this ability on the battlefield, you can say they'll guide the arrival of Sigmar's warriors. Uh, basically, lets people come down within seven inches of the enemy rather than nine inches, so making those charges a bit easier for those uh, strikes from your stormcast. So yeah, that's fun. We've got the Knight Arcanum. Now I think we've had a profile for these previously, so I'm not expecting anything massively different here. Uh, a basic profile for the caster's weapon. Uh, pred predatory endless spells cannot pass across this unit or finish a move within three inches of the unit. That's pretty interesting. So you've got a bit of um, endless spell defence there and the fact that they can't come near her. So essentially most endless spells can't affect her. That's, uh, that's pretty fun. Uh, and then the Blaze of the Heavens. So it's a spell that's a custom value of 7 and a range of 18. Pick an enemy unit within range invisible. They suffer d3 mortal wounds. Uh, add Two to the range for each other friendly Stormcast Eternals Thunder Strike unit within 12 inches. Okay, so you can potentially get a uh, a long range D3 damage Arcane Bolt there for a cast of a 7. Yeah, it's not too bad. We've got the Knight Vexilla. Again, that's probably one of my favourite models out of the box. Let's see what he does. Again, oh, it's, he's got an alright combat profile to be fair. Four attacks, three threes, minus one, two damage. Uh, the banner, once per battle, you can pick up to three friendly Stormcast Eternals within 12 inches. Uh, if you pick them with the ability, you can heal D3 wounds, or if no wounds are allocated, you can return a number of slain models to it. That's really cool. Uh, if you pick a unit twice, you can heal up to 2D3. So basically, once per game, he can just heal up all your units, and again, that's combined with uh, Indrastus. Uh, heal on her war scroll. So yeah, the Stormcast have turned into like a mini uh, death army, which is uh, ironic, considering they use souls stolen from uh, Nagash to uh, to create them. Then we've got the Soul Charge icon. You can reroll charge rolls for friendly Stormcast within 12 inches. And I think that they had previously on the Night Vexilus, but I think this healing thing is new. That's uh, that's really cool. Then we come to the Vindictors. These are the new kind of like battle line choice for the Stormcast. Two wounds each, uh, three plus save, 
pretty good profile. Two attacks, threes and threes, minus one rend, one damage. Two inch rend, so they can probably fight in two ranks as well, which is handy. Uh, the champion gets extra attack. The standard bearer uh, adds one to the bravery of the unit. And then Storm Soul Arsenal, if the unmodified hit roll for an attack is a six, inflicts a mortal wound on top. Oh no, sorry, and the attack sequence ends. So yeah, that's pretty good though, putting out some mortal wounds with their spears. I, uh, I like that. Next up we've got the Praetors. These are phenomenal models as well. So these are like the bodyguard guys. They've got three wounds each and a three plus save. Three attacks, three threes, minus one, two damage. A lot of the Stormcast seem to have a similar profile there. Uh, Soul Forge Guardians, at the start of the first battle round, you pick a Stormcast Eternal Hero, uh, who they'll be bound to. Roll the dice when you allocate a wound or mortal wound while they're within three inches. On a one or two it goes to the hero as normal. On a three to four it's allocated to this unit. On a five or six it's completely negated. That's really cool. So traditionally in the past these kinds of abilities have always passed wounds over to the unit. With these guys, there's a one in three chance that the wounds just get negated all altogether. Yeah, they're really fun. And then we've got the Annihilators. These are the, let's call them Terminators. Two plus save, big chunky Stormcast. Uh, again, similar profile to the other guys that we've seen. Only a one inch range though. Uh, Blazing Impact. We've seen this on Warcom a couple of days ago. When the unit's set up for the first time, you roll a dice for every enemy unit within 10 inches. On a three plus, they take D3 mortal wounds and you can reroll charges. And then when they actually charge in, they uh, they do impact hits. So you can pick an enemy unit within an inch and roll a number of dice equal to the unmodified charge roll. Subtract one if they've got two, and subtract two if they've only got one model. For each four plus they do a mortal wound. So if you roll a long charge, you could do a load of mortal wounds there if you're really lucky. So yeah, they're really cool. And then finally we've got the Stormcast Eternals. Points and Allegiance abilities. Uh, so yeah, 300 points for Indrasta, 140 points for the Vindictors. Again, we'll tot up this in a second and just see how many points that we do get. Allegiance ability, Scions of the Storm I think is the same. For each uh, unit on the battlefield you can have one set up in the sky which comes down. And then Blaze of Glory. Uh, if a friendly Stormcast Terminals model is slain within an inch of an enemy unit, before removing the model pick an enemy unit within an inch and roll a number of dice equal to the wounds characteristic. Uh, add one if they've got Thunderstrike armor. Uh, for each six, they take a mortal wound. That's interesting. So not only can you bring your models back, but when they die, they can do damage to nearby units. So yeah, potentially you don't mind losing a couple of units if you've got Indrasta nearby. You can bring models back each turn as well. That's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, I'm interested to see what we get for the full Stormcast book in the future. So the Stormcast army totals at 1360 points, so you get a massive Stormcast force in this uh, in this box. And it's probably an indication that like we saw with 40k, the average size of armies is going to be smaller in comparison in this edition. But yeah, so across both armies you're getting over 2000 points worth of stuff in here. Crazy good. But that's not all, let's crack on and see what else we get in the box. And packed in the very bottom of this very full box is all the bases and stuff are packed away in these sides. And then we have got the new core rule book as well. So like with uh, Indomitus, you get a nice limited edition cover on here. Uh, this is available separately uh, the same day. This is up for pre-order as well on Saturday. So what we're gonna do is jump cut to uh, inside here. And for the next half of the show, we'll go through, go through all the new rules and visit all the changes in the new edition of Age of Sigma. So we'll see you in a second. So now onto the bit I know a lot of people have been looking forward to, the core book itself. So I have had a couple of days with this book now and uh, yeah, it is really cool. As we've seen with the uh, previous edition of the game, first half of this is pretty much dedicated to the lore. Got some nice new art in there. Pretty much brings us up to date with the, the situation. Uh, so far, so where all the factions are up to, we get information on the events leading up to this, such as the uh, the Broken Realm series, and yeah, really really cool. Obviously, if you are you know an existing fan of Age of Sigma, you are going to know a lot of this already. But there is new stuff in here. This takes us right up to the uh, the era of the Beast, which is uh, after the release of. Um, Kragnos in the, in the Broken Realms. We saw, see all that reflected in here. We also see 
that the uh, Mosul realms were in a pretty poor state when they were ravaged by chaos and before Sigmar came to reclaim them. So really kind of uh, touches on that again, which we visited back in the original release of Age of Sigmar. But uh, yeah, this has fleshed it out and given it a bit more life. There's lots of new artwork in here. We also get lots of cool new maps and the like. Um, yeah, pretty much making it the, I guess, up-to-date one-stop shop for all your Age of Sigmar uh, lore as well, which is really cool. Obviously, with the previous edition, what we saw was the lore get advanced through supplements and expansions. So I'm sure we're going to see the same here. Uh, lots of new info, like the Dawnbringer Crusades, where essentially the uh, the cities of Sigmar uh, expanding out into the wilderness to try and set up new um, new kind of forts and cities to try and reclaim some of the wilderness around them, which is really cool. So I do wonder if we'll see the um, the Dawnbringer Crusades as a new uh, new army, I guess, to replace the cities of Sigmar. Maybe fold in some new plastic kits. Uh, it talks about big floating islands that carry all basically prefabbed um, buildings that they drop down to create these uh, rapidly constructed towns on the fly. And in here, I think it's been shown on Warcom as well, there are some images of some of that new scenery to uh, reflect that. Some big towers and walls and yeah, all looks really good. But yeah, basically, if you've um, if you've got the second edition book, it's a similar kind of format where they'll go through all the various towns and locations and realms. Uh, again, really fleshing it out since it was in the first edition. I feel um, the realms weren't quite as detailed as they are now in in second and third edition. So it definitely feels like a living, breathing place. You know, obviously we've got lots of stuff like the Soulbound RPG that is expanded on that as well. So yeah, this is pretty much your complete law so far. And as with other books, we get an eye section going through all the various factions. Definitely good for someone who may be new to the game as well, who want to know about all the various factions and pick which army they're going to do. They're all detailed here with loads of law. Nobody's kind of missed out. Um, there's not really any hints that I've seen in here. I, in fact, hear some of the new scenery. So we've got a big kind of piece there and two... Um, two statues and there's some walls and I believe that will all come in the kind of scenery and board bundle that will no doubt be out not too long after this. Um, but yeah there's not many hints that I've seen so far and bear in mind I've only had this for a couple of days so I've really been focused on the um, the rules side. But yeah nothing I've seen so far may be pointing towards new factions. Outside of the mention of Chaos Dwarves in the uh, Hobgrot profile that's the kind of biggest hint, and arguably the Dawnbringer Crusade stuff does kind of make a nod towards maybe that being a new faction in the future. So hopefully, I mean, presumably not long after this, we'll see a Stormcast Battle Tome and a Uruk Warclans uh, Battle Tome folding in the new uh, Crawl Boys. So once they're out in the wild, hopefully we'll have an idea then of what what Battle Tomes are on the horizon. You know, we've got a couple of old ones like Deep Deepkin and the Maggot Kin of Nurgle, so uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they're among the first ones. But obviously, at the minute we don't know all the details, so yeah, your guess is as good as mine. I know there's been a few rumours kicking around, but uh, I'd certainly take them with a pinch of salt, certainly until this is out of the way. So, yeah, as ever, we get a nice section in the centre with miniatures of painted armies, just uh, gives you a bit of inspiration on your force. But we are nearly at the actual rules content, which starts here. So the original version of the game had four pages of rules. And then the second edition had, I think, 20. No, in fact, it was 10 pages. 10 pages the second edition had. This is closer to 40 pages of core rules. And then on top of that, we've got additional stuff for the three ways of playing. And then some supplemental stuff at the back. So... It's definitely the most kind of expanded rule set that they've done so far, and there's good reason for that. We start with a nice player's code. This is something that you often see at tournaments, just basically encouraging good playing and sportsmanship, so really good to see. The actual rules themselves are broken down into various kind of categories and subcategories and sub-subcategories under that, basically breaking down every rule concept into a numbered point which means they can do really good things like cross-reference other uh, other rules. You've got kind of highlighted statements 
related to various game mechanics. You've got a sidebar as well that clarifies some of the uh, the concepts discussed. So yeah, really clear rule book. I really like that it's numbered and everything is rule referenced back and forth. So it's going to be a lot easier to look up rules on this one, which is good because it is a little bit more complex than the, than the previous edition of the game. One of the first new things that people will see is the coherency rules. So in the new edition, a unit of uh, one to five models has to be within an inch of another model and a unit of six or more models has to be within an inch of two or more models. So a handy diagram at the bottom here just explaining you could do kind of like a zigzag formation to keep that coherency but this unit wouldn't be able to be in a line because the model at the end wouldn't be within an inch of another model. And you know what? I like that. One of the things I dislike about Age of Sigmar in the past is where you've got just lines of troops basically fencing off parts of the battlefield. It didn't seem particularly realistic or, you know, as realistic as you can get in a game with, you know, dragons and demons and monsters. And it just didn't look good aesthetically on the table. I, I don't know about you, but I like blocks of troops in multiple ranks. Uh, vibe of the, you know, the world that was Warhammer. And this kind of captures that. You've got, you know, units that really, if they've got long range weapons, they can fight in two ranks. You've got blocks that can move up the battlefield. You're going to have to be clever with your deployment. If you want to fence things off, you can still do it, but you're going to have multiple units and make sure that you've, you've covered that land. So, yeah, I think it's a good change. It'll take a little while for people to get used to that. And, you know, to kick, to all these things take a couple of games until they're, they're second nature. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. They did exactly the same in 40k as well, and that's been no issue really. Uh, arguably as well in this edition, as we'll see in a bit later, your units aren't going to be as big anyway, but that's another point, and we'll come to it in a little bit. So yeah, really cool. The way it's presented and laid out makes it really clear to follow, which is really, really good. One of the things that they also um, cover in here is um, triggered effect. So if you've got an ability that, I don't know, does something on a roll of a six. Now currently you might have a few scenarios where multiple things happen when you roll a six to hit on a unit, for example. In the new edition of the game, they clarify that if you've got multiple effects that trigger on a dice roll, the player that rolled that dice picks which effect happens. So I don't know, you've got a unit that, I don't know, their war scroll says that on hits of six, they do mortal wounds, but they're, then they're in an aura that causes them to get an additional um, I don't know, additional hit on a roll of a six. Under the new rules, when you roll a dice, you'd be able to pick which of those two effects trigger uh, if you did roll a six. Which is good, because it means you can... Obviously, you're not getting the benefit of both of them at the same time, but you could have a different effect trigger each time you're fighting based on what you rolled, which is pretty handy. Uh, so nice clarification. We also get clarification on any simultaneous abilities where the player who's taking the turn gets priority, then their opponent. Anything that happens kind of outside of normal turn order, it'll be a roll off to determine. So yeah, they've cleared up a lot of things like that. Um, we Later on in the book we get a nice breakdown of things like always strikes first and always strikes last as well. So yeah, I think they've really put some effort into uh, making sure that everything's clear and easy to follow. One of the biggest changes in the third edition though is how command points work. So in second edition, obviously you get a command point at the start of your turn and you, um, you could get additional command points by paying 50 points for them, by uh, bringing battalions. That's all changed somewhat. So if you pick to go first in a battle round, you get one command point. The person who goes second in the battle round gets two command points. You also get an additional command point if your general is alive and on the table as well. So yeah, you're looking two to three command points per turn. What's changed though is that you both players get those at the start of the battle round, so your opponent's got some to use straight away. There's a lot of command abilities that are reactionary, so you can use them in their turn. And yeah, we'll look at those in a little bit as we go through the book, but uh, there's some really cool stuff that you can do in your opponent's turn now. Uh, secondary to that, you lose all your command points at the end of the battle round. So you really want to be spending them, and believe me, you will be spending them because there's lots of cool stuff you can do. 
Going forward, I think new battle tomes will have a lot of uh, command abilities. The Soul Black Grave Lords, for example, have got an awful lot in their book. When we did the review for that, we said that we reckon you're probably going to have more command points to play with in third edition. And that's why that book seems so command point heavy. So wouldn't surprise me if that's the same in other factions going forward. Another new thing that we've got are heroic actions. So in the hero phase, each player can pick a hero to do a heroic action and they do different effects. So heroic leadership, uh, you're on a four plus essentially you get a command point uh, that can be spent by that hero. If your general's dead, that turns to a two plus. So basically it's a, I don't know, a sub officer stepping up and taking command in the event of the, the general dying and that's why he gets it on a two plus. That's pretty fun. Again, another source of those command points. Heroic willpower lets them unbind a spell as if they were a wizard. So that gives a bit of magical defense to uh, non-mage heavy armies, as you know, we've got corn, for example, you can now stop a spell by using this, which is really nice. The strongest one is their finest hour. That can be used once per game per hero. And that adds one to their wound rolls and one to their save rolls. So that can also be comboed with command abilities as well, because in the new edition, command abilities uh, each unit can only issue a maximum of one command ability and each unit can only receive a maximum of one command ability and each command ability can only be used once per phase. So there's quite a few restrictions. Um, this gives you some of the effects of some command abilities without being a command ability, freeing up your, your character to, to use those elsewhere. So yeah, they're pretty cool. And then finally we've got Heroic Recovery. This is a nice way of healing up your characters. You roll 2d6. If it's less than your hero's bravery, you heal d3 wounds. If it's equal to your uh, hero's bravery, you heal one wound. And yeah, each player gets to pick one of these at the start of the hero phase. So yeah, that's really, really cool. We see at the bottom here one of the new command abilities that they've introduced. Rally. This is a way of healing up your units. So you pick a unit. They can't be within three inches of the enemy and you roll a dice for each model in the unit that has been destroyed. On a six plus they get added back to the unit. So if you're really lucky you could have say a unit of uh, Man Crusher Gargants that have lose, lost two models and there's one left. You could roll two dice and be really lucky get two sixes and have a full strength unit again. So it's a, you know, it's a one in six chance per model but it could it could happen. Uh, I think that's really good, especially on elite units, so Varangard, stuff like that. I'd certainly chance it and take, take the chance to do it. And it's at the start of the hero phase, so it doesn't specify that it's your hero phase, so equally you can do it uh, in your opponent's turn. And a lot of these new command abilities, I think you're expected to use within your opponent's hero phase, making it, well, sorry, even within your hero... Uh, even within your opponent's turn, making uh, the game a lot more interactive and you can get involved more during their turn, which is a really, really cool thing to see. Uh, for movement, they've clarified a few things. So a normal move is a move that isn't a run or a charge. Um, that clears up a few things such as the Blood Knights for the Grave Lords. They had a rule that was odd under second edition where they can make a normal move while in combat. Essentially, that means that they can make a move and then because it wasn't technically a retreat, they can still charge, so really, really cool. We see another couple of command abilities that can be used in the movement phase. At the doubles, very similar to how it was. However, you have to declare you're using it before you roll. So basically, you can't roll the dice and then decide to change it. You now have to just decide, yep, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be running six inches. So that's fair enough. The second one's really cool, redeploy. When an enemy unit finishes their uh, move within nine inches of one of your units, you can spend a command point to move that unit d6 inches. So you could essentially uh, move units out of charge range uh, or reposition them onto objectives or loads of sneaky stuff you can do. I really, really like that. So yeah, with careful, careful positioning, you can make sure that your units aren't going to get charged. Now it is a d6, you could get unlucky and and roll less, but even an inch could mess up their charge in the uh, the preceding uh, charge phase. So yeah, I really like this one. Again, we get a lot more command points, but I'm gonna to want to use all these command abilities all the time. Movement gets some clarifications how 
moving over scenery works essentially you measure the distance up and down as you're moving over it shooting face is a couple of tweaks so look out sir still exists however uh, here, uh, heroes with a wounds characteristic of 10 or more it now doesn't apply to where previously it was just monsters that ignored it now your high wound heroes also can still be shot with no penalty I think some people were expecting that to maybe change to how it works in 40k that isn't the case it's still the same as it is in the current edition of the game we do get some new command abilities that trigger in the charge phase as well so forward to victory same as it used to be you can re-roll a charge but there's also a reactionary one that the enemy can use in the charge phase as well so once your opponent has completed a charge move you pick a unit within nine inches of the enemy unit that charged and they can shoot doesn't have to be the unit that's being charged so you could have a i don't know a unit here and then have a unit of archers or something just behind them and use them as a charge deterrent it's essentially 40k overwatch um but it's really good you just hit on minus one so if you hit on three plus you hit on force yeah that's that's going to be really brutal um obviously with command abilities only being able to use once uh issued once received once or even used in a phase once what you probably want to do is put some sacrificial units in to throw forward to try and draw out these kind of abilities so the opponent's going to have to make a, a tough decision on when they actually react and fire that shot. So yeah, I quite like that. Onto the combat phase. Now we do see some tweaks here, which we'll look in a little bit. I uh, just want to call out, we get a nice breakdown of the strike first and strike last effects. So what order people fight in when you have got those conflicting statuses on them. A big thing that we do have though is um, hits and wounds now capped to a maximum of plus one or minus one so that's a big deal you can't have technically you can have stacking buffs but it caps out at one uh, obviously there's still a benefit of having stacking ones because it means that if your opponent's got some uh you know debuffs on you with minuses to hit you can try and negate that a little bit so yeah that's pretty good saves work in a similar way they have a maximum cap of plus one to a save but there's no maximum to the minus. So basically you can never improve your own save by more than one, but multiple things can bring down a save, which is good. Um, and all of these things, a one is always a failure, and a six is always a success for the hit and the wound. For the save rolls, obviously as is the minute, they don't succeed on a, on a six, but the ones always fail, which is important for, we've got a few war scrolls at the minute, where there's some strange stuff happening with the with the modifiers where you could have like unrendable bastilodons and stuff that isn't a thing now ones always fail so that's really good to see we also get two really cool command abilities that are triggered in the combat phase as well all out attack it gives a target unit plus one to their um, hit rolls in combat and all out defense gives a unit plus one to their save rolls so yeah, really good way of uh, buffing up your units and getting those important fights to matter. We see a new uh, mechanic. It's not really a new mechanic, it's more a rename of an old mechanic in ward saves. So all those abilities that shrug wounds, so disgustingly resilient, uh, deathless minions, all that kind of stuff is now referred to as a ward save. So we saw earlier in the box, we had uh, Indrasta. She's got a four plus ward save. That means that if a if damage goes through her, her save and gets allocated to her, she can ignore it on a four plus. You can only ever benefit from a single ward save. So if you've got multiple abilities that do similar things, you pick the best one. So I like that they've now got a kind of catch all term for them. So rules that interact with them can specify what it is. So, you know, they could have, for example, in the future, weapons that ignore ward saves. They can reference this, which is cool. Battleshock has stayed much the same. Again, we've still got Inspiring Presence, but bearing in mind you can only do it once per phase, and each unit can only receive or issue a command once. Makes it a little bit tougher to know when you need to do it. One of the things that has disappointed me in this edition, and there's not much that has disappointed me, but unfortunately this is one of them, is Terrain. They haven't really changed very much at all. We have a few new things, so Defensible Terrain is uh, terrain that you can garrison, so, you know, forts, 
uh, buildings, that kind of thing. And a bit more detail than it was in um, previous editions of the game. Uh, we now have large and very large terrain specified by the size of them. And we've got the rules for Wildwoods baked into the rules as well. So we saw those in Broken Realms Kragnos, where you can't draw a line of sight across them, unless you've got a wounds characteristic of 10 or more. Uh, basically that's now in the main rules, because that's the only real kind of weird scenery that doesn't interact with the other rules. It's a shame, I'd have kind of liked to have seen expanded rules like we saw in 40k. I do hope that maybe at some point we get an expansion maybe that fleshes out. Uh, terrain. It does mention that on the warhammer.com website we have got uh, a list of all the kind of scenery rules for them so I'm hoping we get some fresh uh, war scrolls for the actual terrain pieces that make them a bit more fun to use and interactive because I've never really been a fan of just rolling on those uh, random mysterious terrain effects charts. Uh, that's just me, you might like them but yeah I always thought the way it worked in 40k was better with kind of keywords and rules associated to each different type of piece. We also have clarified rules on demolishing scenery. Now obviously we've got a few things in the game that can do that, Kragnos being one of them. You do not remove the scenery piece, it stays on the board, however it can no longer be garrisoned and if it's a terrain piece uh, you no longer get the benefits of that uh, the terrain piece. So yeah, but it's interesting that you keep the piece on the board because I think when we first originally read it, we thought you'd remove the entire scenery piece, which makes moving around a bit easier and kind of changes the uh, the layout of the battlefield. Objectives have also been reworked a tiny bit uh, in that monsters now count as five models, and any model with a wounds characteristic of five or more now counts as two models. So it works in a similar way to how the, the ogres and the mega gargants work as counting for more models makes those uh, larger models a bit more important for capturing objectives now where previously you know a, a dragon standing on an objective with two goblins near him uh, would lose the objective to the goblins which always felt a little bit silly in Sigma so I'm glad that they've changed that. Uh, objective marker itself is still the same it is the point in the center now 40k changed to the the objective itself was the, the whole thing. No, it's just a central point and it's still six inches from that for control. Next we've got updated rules for wizards. Um, the main differences that we get here are that miscasts are a thing again. So if you roll a double one, you suffer d3 mortal wounds and that wizard can't cast any more spells that phase. So really like this. Uh, it makes it a bit of a risk to try and cast throwaway spells because potentially you could do some major damage to yourself. So always liked miscasts and perils of the warp and stuff like that so good to see it back in the game. Um, the spells themselves have been reworked quite a bit so Arcane Bolt is now completely different. Uh, it goes off on a five and it essentially then uh, creates a ball of energy that floats above the head of your wizard. Uh, at any point until the next hero phase they can choose to unleash that magical bolt uh, to an enemy unit within 12 inches to do one mortal wound or an enemy unit within three inches to do d3 mortal wounds, kind of making it into a defensive overwatch ability uh, equally because you don't have to launch it until your next hero phase. If an enemy unit maybe moves across their path within 12 inches of them, you could fire off the arcane bolt. So yeah, quite an interesting one. I like that one. Mystic Shield has also been reworked. It now goes off on a five and it adds one to your save. So that's how it was back in the original version of Age of Sigmar. Then it changed to reroll ones. It is back to plus one save. And that is, again, due to the fact that these save modifiers cap at plus one. It means that, you know, you've not got potential of putting silly, unrendable saves on things. Endless spells have changed quite a bit. And we've seen a little bit, the kind of full breakdown of them. But basically, uh, priests can now try to... Um, dispel them as well which is interesting. Priests have got quite a few new buffs in this new edition and I can see a lot of people trying to bring a priest with them in their army because they can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, and the spells now also end as well when they hit the board edge so it is easier to deal with the spells arguably but they are they are really really good. So we see here the full rules for endless spells and in the previous edition of the game, you'd launch it, you'd do some damage, and then the control of the endless spells would be based on who had the priority, and then you'd alternate controlling endless spells one after the other. That has been completely reworked, and each wizard controls an endless spell that they cast 
as long as within 30 inches of them. Now each wizard can only control one endless spell at a time. If they've got multiple ones they have to pick which one they control. So then you go through every hero phase, so that is yours and your opponent, not at the start of the battle round, uh, and move your endless spells. The opponent will move their endless spells and then anything that's out of range of your wizards is deemed as a wild endless spell and then you take turns moving them, starting with the player who took the first turn. This gives you a load more control over those endless spells. Before, there's always a bit of a liability in case that endless spell turned around and hit you in the face. As long as you keep it within 30 inches of yourself, you've got full control of that endless spell and it's moving in your turn and your opponent's turn as well, meaning that potentially you can do a lot more damage with them. Now, we know that in the General's Handbook there's going to be updated profiles for the Endless Spells. At the time of recording, we haven't had access to the General's Handbook yet, so I don't know what they are. I imagine they're probably going to go up in points by the fact that they're just so much more reliable now. Um, but yeah, I think more people would be likely to use those offensive predatory spells because you can control them, which is really, really fun. Priests have also improved. We mentioned earlier a lot of people would be wanting to take them. They can now um, use one of two generic prayers. So in addition to the ones that they know on their war scroll or their uh, prayer list in their battle tome, they get access to two new ones. So Bless is a really handy one that gives a friendly unit a 6 plus ward save. So don't forget that's a new word for a wound shrug. Yeah, that's that's pretty good being able to throw a 6 plus ignore wounds on a, on a unit. Yeah, really good. Really worth taking the priest just for that. There's also a um, offensive anti-priest kind of spell. It's got a 48 inch range and um, it chants on a 2 plus, so really reliable prayer. Uh, does a wound to an enemy priest. If the rolls are 6, it does d3 mortal wounds to an enemy priest, so... Yeah, pretty good. I think we'll be seeing a lot more priests, so we'll have a bit of priest wars going on with them throwing smites at each other. Uh, invocations as well work similar to endless spells, where priests can now banish uh, invocations as well. So that's pretty cool. Follows the same rules as the endless spells as well, but if they hit the board edge, they just end as well. So yeah, there's lots, lots of more ways of dealing with those... Um, invocations and endless spells and yeah that's a good change. Another thing that's got a buff in the book are monsters. Now obviously we saw earlier that monsters count as more models for the purposes of controlling objectives. They also get monstrous rampage abilities so at the end of the charge phase each player and this is again in each turn yours and your opponents gets to go through their monsters and pick uh, monstrous rampages for them to do. There's a total of four of them. Uh, Rule that one, um, you pick a unit within three inches on a three plus, they cannot receive or issue commands in the following phase. So, so if you know your opponent's going to uh, try and use one of those core cool command abilities that act activates in the combat phase, you can shut that down by putting that on them. So a three plus, it's pretty reliable. Yeah, that's not too bad. We've got Stomp, essentially on a two plus, it does some mortal wounds to them. Titanic Jewel gives you a plus one to hit against a specific monster, which is really cool. And then finally, Smash to Rubble on a three plus uh, basically destroys a, a terrain piece, like we said earlier. It stays on the board, but it loses its uh, its rules, basically. So you can shut down those uh, army terrain pieces that I know some people find frustrating. Just throw a monster at them and they'll break it. It'd be really cool. We then get some clarifications on profiles and damage tables. And again, everything's broken down. So it's very clear and can be rules referenced later on how the various rules interact with each other. So again, I think that's a really good thing. We get a new concept in the way you build your armies, however. So currently each unit has a minimum size and a maximum size. In the third edition of Sigma, that concept is gone. Everything just has a cost. And then all non-battle line units you can reinforce once and all battle line units you can reinforce twice. So what that means is for each time you reinforce a unit you can add another increment of troops to it. So say if you had a 10-man squad of goblins for example and they were battle line you could choose to reinforce it once to make it a unit of 20 or reinforce it twice to make it a unit of 30. If, however, you had a unit of three, uh, Varangard, for example, and they weren't battle line, 
the most you could do is reinforce them once to have a unit of six. So that is going to change the way people build lists because you're not necessarily going to be able to have some of the units that you previously had at the sizes you used to have. What works kind of in tandem with this is that in match play games there's a cap on how many reinforcements you can do. Uh, for 2,000 points I think it's four times. Your battle line unit that you reinforce twice, that counts as two. So you're not going to be able to bring all your armies at this, this full squad size. I, I very much feel that a lot of your force is going to be at those minimum uh, base unit sizes off the profile. Which is, which is really interesting, but you've already decided whether you, you reinforce your elite units, so they're more of a hammer, or do you reinforce your uh, battle line units that can be reinforced twice and maybe use them to sit on an objective as a bit of an anvil. So yeah, I think that we'll see people maybe leaning towards units that haven't been used in the past. Bearing in mind coherency as well, some of those elite units with big bases are going to be a bit cumbersome in large sizes, so you might be better off taking them in smaller units. Uh, obviously in the Dominion box we see a lot of the Stormcast have a 2 inch range, which means they work really well in two ranks of five uh, as a nice kind of smaller fighting block rather than the big strings of troops that you used to see. So yeah, I really think this is going to uh, mix up the armies that we see a little bit. Another thing we get clarified in here as well are units with conditional battle line status. So, for example, in Cities of Sigmar, uh, there's a way of taking steam tanks as battle line. When they become battle line, they lose the Behemoth keyword. So, um, so yeah, all the all the army construction rules based around that. Uh, it, basically, you treat them as if they're battle line. Now, that does have an effect on some of the things we'll look at in a little bit. Um, I know a lot of these have had FAQs over the years, but it's good to have that clarified and spelled out in the core rulebook. So we have got battalions. Now, War Scroll battalions still exist. However, they can't be used in match play games. Uh, they're still valid in, in open play, uh, but yeah, you can't use those in uh, match play. And I think part of the problem was uh, some armies had much better War Scroll battalions than others. And it also kind of forced your hand with army construction. A lot of the successful lists were following the same war score battalions, I saw the same units. I like it when you see lots of different armies and there's lots of different things in there and I think that's been maybe the idea where this this core battalions concepts come from. They don't cost any points, it's essentially a way of arranging your force in order to gain additional benefits. Now with the battle regiment for example, you can put that together and your army will be a one-drop army, you're definitely going first, brilliant. However, some of the other battalions give you different bonuses. So we've got things such as once per battle, command abilities, inverted commas, but they don't count as a command ability being issued. So technically, you've still got your character to issue that command ability. Uh, equally, some of these give you access to additional enhancements. So this is a way of getting additional artifacts or even additional spells on your wizards. Yeah, I I think it's going to be really interesting breaking down what battalions people will use. Will they try and max out on the artifacts and some of the other abilities that they've got? Will they stick to that tried and trusted one drop force? I think it's really going to mix things up uh, and I'm excited to see what list builders use with this in tournaments and the like. So we mentioned enhancements a little while ago, and this is basically now the term for all those things that you pick at, on your army list when you can create in the force. So your command trait, your artifact, your spell law, so getting a spell for each, each wizard, uh, prayers, your triumphs. Everyone picks a triumph now as part of their army list, but only the list with the smallest points value gets to use it. Are there any unique ones such as mount traits and the like? Now, some of these uh, battalions unlock additional uh, enhancements. So, for example, you could go for an extra spell law enhancement, and that would give every wizard in your army an additional spell, or every priest in your army additional prayer. So there's a lot more freedom to what those battalions give you, rather than just a command point and extra artifact. And there's some really fun stuff. They put some 
kind of generic ones within the book that you can pick from. And I imagine we'll see a lot of these expanded in new battle tomes as well. So for the universal command traits, we've got reroll and in charge. We've got in the hero phase on a five plus you get a command point. We've got reroll chanting if they're a priest. You can add a wound to the characteristic or they can reroll cast and dispel. So they're pretty good. Uh, we've got some generic artifacts that are pretty nice. Five plus ward save, uh, giving one of their weapons plus one damage. You can make them a wizard, or if they're already a wizard, they can um, attempt to cast an additional spell. And you've got the Seed of Rebirth, which lets them re-roll the Battle Recovery Heroic Ability. So that's the one way you can regain wounds in the hero phase. We then get some universal spells. Uh, obviously there's a lot less than we did when we had the various realm spells, but they are very good. So Flaming Weapon uh, goes off on a 6 and you can give one of their weapons plus 1 damage, which is really good. Uh, levitate gives them it gives a unit fly and ghost mist you can basically make a uh, a piece of terrain block line of sight so some pretty interesting stuff the really cool ones i think are the priest ones and this is why i think a lot of people will want to take some priests in their forces uh, guidance can give you an extra command point heal you pick a unit within 12 inches goes off on a three plus and you can heal d3 wounds allocated to the model that's really cool Curse is also ace. You pick an enemy unit and it makes it so that any hits of six against them cause a mortal wound in addition to any other damage. So yeah, I think these are really good abilities and I'm gonna try and squeeze some priests into my list to make advantage of them. Um, and then the triumphs that we get again are different than what we had previously. We've got Bloodthirsty, which lets you uh, reroll the charge roll. You've got Inspired, which lets a unit have plus one to wound rolls. And you've got Indomitable, which lets you um, auto pass battle shock. And again, in theory, you could use a battalion to uh, purchase additional triumphs and you can stack these up, but you only get the benefit of them if you've got the lower points value. So it's a bit of a gamble, that one. The book then goes through the concept of battle packs and this is very much like it is in, in 40K. So this is a way of separating the actual kind of core rules from the, uh, the the pack of battle plans that you're playing the game with. It lets you have your open narrative and match play as separate things and have separate supplements that interact separately without affecting the main rules, which is a really slick way of doing it. It's worked really well in 40k. Another thing I like about this as well, we see a lot of the studio armies. And we've seen this in the Crusade sections in 40k. And again, I really like seeing people's actual armies that they use. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So first in the book we've got open play, and open play is pretty fun. This is, I guess, the most bare bones, no nonsense version of Age of Sigmar. Um, essentially, it lets you generate up a random mission and and play through that. So don't worry about uh, having a necessarily balanced force that's on the players to come up. This is more like, I suppose, the vibe of the original Age of Sigmar. Just throw some models on the table and have a fun time. Uh, obviously, you know you've got points values to get uh, to get a force together on there, and we split the table size into three different sizes. So 750 points, which uses the smallest uh, 30 inches by 44 inch footprint, 2,000 points, which is double that, and over 2,000 points, which is an extra one of those towers again. So again, that's using the increments that have been seen in 40k. So they're basically in increments of uh, Warcry boards or kill team boards. But yeah, basically with that, you've got a number of different uh, charts to generate up your mission. So you roll up randomly the deployment map, you roll up the victory conditions, the twist, the ruse, and an arcane prize. So yeah, pretty fun. Um, now I've not really done much in the way of open play, but I do see the appeal of those quick charts to just roll up a nice random battle. Now the thing I'm most excited about in this book, however, is the narrative play section. Now. Regular viewers will know that Crusade was our favourite thing about the uh, the latest edition of 40k and this is essentially Crusade for Age of Sigmar. Path to Glory they call it and this is a way of chronicling your army's uh, legend up through your characters getting experience, maybe getting injured when they lose in battle. Um, in addition to that, in the Path to Glory system, you actually kind of build up your own stronghold and settlement and have all these territories around it that give you different abilities. So you could have 
uh, wild lands within your territory that is teeming with monsters, so it's easier to bring a monster to your list, giving you plus one on your monster allowance. The start of the game, you've got quite limited allowances of what uh, units you can bring, and then by growing your territory and having these different uh, strongholds and areas, you can build that up. Very, very similar to how it works in, in 40k with the requisition points. It's glory in uh, Path to Glory, but it's essentially the same thing and lets you upgrade all those things. I really like the uh, the kind of uh, territories and um, stronghold mechanic because you can upgrade them and give them different bonuses and yeah, we'll see some of them later, they're really fun. What's also different is that in Path to Glory, you pick a quest that is maybe kind of independent of the, the missions that you're playing. There could be one where you're looking for an artifact. So over the course of a couple of games, you eventually find this artifact and get to add a artifact to your rare uh, order of battle. Or maybe you're hunting down an, a wild endless spell. So you're maybe searching like forests and graveyards to try and find this. Eventually you'll get it and be able to add it to your roster. So really, really fun. And again, you can kind of create some really nice narrative with these, which I guess is the intent. Now, there's a few things in here that um, point towards there being a series of supplements. They do say that they're going to bring out books set in different parts of the realms which expand this further, which again, I'm really excited to see. Um, all the Crusade stuff that we've seen for 40k has been really fun. So similar to this, you know, I don't know, if there was an Akshi book that gave us uh, lots of rules for fighting in the realm of fire with different territories and different features there, I think that would be really fun. And then, yep, yeah, just as in 40k, after the battle you gain glory, you gain experience for your heroes, they can level up and get different abilities. Your heroes can get experience and unlock uh, new command traits for them. So yeah, really, really fun stuff. If you played Crusade, very, very similar. The main difference really being the stronghold system. So the stronghold uh, controls how many territories you can have how many barracks you can have. So barracks is what you use to uh, upgrade the number of units that you've got. So in 40k, technically, you can keep adding your supply level up, so you can always keep adding units to it. In Sigmar, it is based around your barracks. So an imposing stronghold, for example, can only have five barracks. Once you've hit that cap, you can't add any more barracks until you level it up to a mighty stronghold. But obviously there's you know quite a lot of um, glory re uh, requirements in order to do that. So that's a really good way of kind of maybe reining you in a little bit and keeping the campaign on focus, which is really fun. Uh, it also mentions outposts. Now outposts aren't in this rule set, but it does say that it's something that's going to feature in the supplements as well. So that's intriguing. I wonder if there'll be different rules for different factions as well. So... I don't know, Grave Lords get a spooky old castle in the middle of nowhere that gets some special abilities. So yeah, interested to see how that plays out. But yeah, really, really fun. The territories themselves essentially give you different buffs, but it's a nice flavorful way of doing it. I know when we do our Path to Glory, I think we'll probably draw up maps of our various uh, strongholds and the territories around them, so you can see at a glance kind of what they've got. And again, as your strongholds get bigger, you can have more territories and eventually have a big sprawling city with a castle in the center as your as your territory, which is a nice way of kind of representing your forces for this Path to Glory campaign. So yeah, really, really looking forward to playing this. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed Crusade and this looks really, really fun. Can't wait to try it out. Now, even though we know that there's some supplements coming for Path to Glory, we do get a battle pack for it. So again, we've got the split in different board sizes and we have six missions here, all with some different vibes and objectives. So a nice little taster of, um, of Path to Glory. Again, I imagine when the supplements come out, they're going to have a lot more missions and, and stuff that interacts with it. But you can certainly get going with the Path to Glory campaign just using the core book. And then the final and probably most popular way to play is match play. And this again has seen quite a few changes. We have got a um, battle pack and this outlines the various units you can take. One of the things that it does um, call out in here 
is how many reinforced units you can take. So like we said earlier, for 2,000 points you can take a maximum of four. A unit that has been reinforced twice, so a battle line one, counts as two. So you are going to have to think about your unit sizes and what you take. One thing that's also changed here is that there's a maximum number of endless spells you can take. So for 2,000 points, three. And it's worth noting that in the core rules for endless spells, you can only ever take as many as you've got uh, casters. So even though it's details 0 to 3 here, if you've only got one wizard in your army, you can still only take one endless spell. So that stops some of the silly lists where, I don't know, you had like magic generating battery zinch armies, I guess, with lots of endless spells. Uh, I mean, arguably zinch have got enough wizards to do it, but it is another kind of uh, balancing thing that they've put in there, which is pretty fun. Now, you aren't restricted to the number of battalions you can take, and there's no points cost to them, but you can't take any of the old War Scroll battalions, like we said earlier. Um, yeah, I think there's going to be some fun working out the ideal battalions to take for different forces, and they're not necessarily going to be the same for everyone, which is great from the point of view of stopping the, you know, the generic netlist that everybody sees. This should go some way to, to changing that a little bit. One of the other new things that we see in match play are grand strategies. So this is a way of getting three additional victory points at the end of the game. We've got Sever the Head. You've got to take out all the heroes in your enemy's force. We've got Vendetta. You've got to take out your enemy's general while yours is still alive. And then Hold the Line. You've got to have battle line units left on the battlefield. So yeah, pretty, pretty interesting. They're worth three points and... Really, it might persuade people to take a lot of battle line to keep those back, because that's arguably the easiest one to keep, though I guess if the opponent knows you've got that, they're going to be trying to take out your battle line. So, yeah, these will be interesting. Obviously, your opponent's trying to complete their grand strategy as well. Adding another twist on top of that, though, are the uh, battle tactics. So at the start of your hero phase, you have to pick a battle tactic, and you can only try each battle tactic once. And this is a way of getting another two victory points during that turn. So break their spirit, destroy an enemy unit within your opponent's territory. Broken ranks, destroy an enemy unit from their starting army. So that means that summoned units won't, won't work for that one. We've got conquer, uh, take an objective that your opponent controls. You've got repel, uh, pick an enemy unit within your territory. If you destroy it, you get the point. Seize the centre. You've got to get more friendly models and enemy models within six inches of the center. And then slay the warlord, slay your opponent's general. And again, they'll be trying to do the same to you. You declare this so you, you each know what you're doing. Yeah, I think this is going to be a really interesting way of mixing it up. That's a lot of command points over the course of the game. Another ten there, plus three for the uh, grand strategy. That could really change the outcome of some of these missions. Now in the book we only get three battle plans. They are kind of variants on stuff that we've seen. So, you know, burning objectives, that kind of thing. We know General's Handbook is out the same day as this book. So I imagine we'll get a lot more missions within that book. But at least you get three in the book to start with. And then the final part of the book goes through some just variants, different ways of playing, kind of fun one-off games that you'll probably do. So we see Siege Warfare. This is very similar to the Siege rules we've seen in the Broken Realm series and a battle plan to go with it. We see Triumph and Treachery return. So back in Warhammer Fantasy, Triumph and Treachery was our favourite way of playing games of Warhammer. And this returns, and again, it keeps the same concept. Each turn you pick who your opponent is. You can't affect any other players. Nice way of four players getting together and stabbing each other in the back, which is really, really fun. I hope we see this expanded in some more Triumph and Treachery missions come out, because I've seen at the minute we've only got the one battle plan for it. And then finally, there's rules for fighting underground in tunnels uh, with wild monsters and that kind of thing. So these, these aren't necessarily going to be games that you play all the time, but they are fun one-off ones. I mean, if they expanded Triumph and Treachery into its own supplement, I would absolutely play that all the time because we love Triumph and Treachery. So yeah, and that is the new uh, core book for Age of Sigmar. Really impressed with what they've done. I really like the... Uh, the way they've got all the rules referenced and I think it's going to make things a lot easier to know what's happening um, in the game, be able to reference rules. FAQs will be easier to do because they can reference specific points in the document as well. 
So I know that was a long gold video, but that was a look at the new Dominion launch box for the third edition of Warhammer Age of Sigmar. Uh, massive thanks to Games Workshop for sending us this early for us to have a look at. Currently furiously painting up the miniatures as well, so hopefully by the time this is up, I should have some uh, pictures of the painted models on the website, if not very soon after. Uh, we will also be looking to do a battle report on the day the game goes up for pre-order, live here on YouTube and over on Twitch as well, using the forces out of this box. So yeah, if you uh, are interested in seeing that, uh, give us a follow and, and you'll get notified when that goes up. But yeah, really, really good box. We don't know the price. I believe it's going to be around £125. That's not confirmed. By the time this video is out, that might be general knowledge anyway. 125 is the price point for Indomitus. Now, if you think the rule box, what, £30, £40 pounds alone? Considering you get two armies, both of which are over a thousand points, I think that's an absolute steal. Obviously, we've seen from Indomitus as well, when the miniatures came out separately, the, the, the value of the box is a lot more than the uh, the sticker price. So, yeah, I know we obviously we've been lucky enough to get one. Um, I would say if you do want to get it, just make sure that you're on the Games Workshop website early because I think it will be popular. I think there will be people disappointed that they can't get hold of one. If it does sell out, hopefully we do see something similar to last year where Games Workshop make them to order. Obviously, that's not guaranteed or a given. I hope we have got enough uh, supply for everyone to get one, though, because it is a great box. And I'd I'd much rather this be a permanent line than the the kind of starter boxes that they've got for forty k. Just because it's such a good just a good box for getting into the game. So yeah, um, but no, really, really good. I've I've really enjoyed building the models from it. The rule book's great. Really looking forward to playing some games with it. And obviously we've only had a couple of days with this in the uh, the short space of time before the video had to go live. So over the next week on Sprues and Brews, we will be updating this with more thoughts as we get some more games in and get our teeth into the system. Any, any quirks that we find, anything like that. Uh, if you do want the full kind of deep dive into everything in the book, I have got a full write-up over on the website as well where I break down everything, all the command abilities, all the profiles of the units, the whole lot. So if you're interested in that, check it out. But yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know it's a long one, but I uh, wanted to make sure we had everything covered from the new Dominion box. So yeah, we'll have a lot of cool Age of Sigmar content coming up. So yeah, make sure you're uh, subscribed if you want to see it all. And yeah, hope we see you soon. Have a good one.